Okay, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come before you once again. We ask that you order our steps, lead us, guide us, and teach us in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Just want to say welcome one and all. We are actually dealing with part four. We are actually dealing with the healing aspect of digestive aches and pains. This is belching, burping, farting, um, H. pylori, you, you know, um, gastritis, everything that has to do with the digestive uh, uh, process um, when it comes to our stomach. We're going to deal with any type of issues that's related to that. We mentioned that we're using a three-fold approach. Three-fold approach. What do I mean by a three-fold approach? The three-fold approach, meaning that we're going to use the faucet, we're going to use the unplugging of the sink, and we're going to use the mopping up principle. Let me give you an example. Let's say I came to your home, and the pipe is on. The pipe is running, and there's a stopper in the sink, and the water is flowing out of the sink onto the ground. Should I grab a mop and start mopping up, or what should I do in its order? I'll tell you the best approach that I have seen thus far. The best approach is that you turn off the faucet, turn off the pipe, unplug the sink, and mop it up. Let's repeat that again. You turn off the faucet, turn off the pipe, unplug the sink, and mop it up. If that's clear, you say amen. That is the method we'll be doing this evening. You will find that a diet that is high in flesh and thereby product will be a breeding ground for causing acid reflux, okay? A diet that is high in flesh and a byproduct would be a breeding ground for acid reflux. And the reason being, these items take much longer to digest in the stomach. Um, and these items also, too, are highly acidic. Okay, so remember that not only are they highly acidic, but they do take a lot longer to digest. Now, um, we don't have a problem with things being acidic, but we have a problem with things being highly acidic, okay? And the reason why I'm making the distinction, because the majority of your grains are acidic, okay? But one of the things you'll find is that grains properly prepared digest very easily, Okay, so we want you to avoid the eggs, things like cheese and milk. These items are very difficult items to digest. As a matter of fact, these items should not be considered as food. Fry food as well as highly processed food should be eliminated from the diet. All free oils should be avoided while cooking. Avoid high salt intake. Um, this increases stomach irritation and ulcers. Now, let's go back to the fry food and using oil in the food. Um, we have since taken a position here in Antigua um, that we do not use any form of oil in our food preparation. And I want to encourage our listeners to consider do the same. We're told in the writings of Sister Ellen G. White, that when oil is, is used in meal preparation, it renders the food indigestible, okay? When oil is used in food preparation, it renders the food um, indigestible. I will tell you that one of the things you got to do, you got to reason from cause effect, cause to effect. Let's reason a little, okay? Um, you have things like your fruits and your vegetables. These would be considered like simple carbs. Um, then you have your complex carbs, which would be like your beans and your grains and your provisions, okay? Um, then you have your fats, like your nuts, your seeds, and things along that line. Let's go and do some reasoning. I want you to stop and think about this for a moment, okay? Let's deal with the fruit aspect, and then we can come right across the board. Remember now, that your fruits are pre-digested, meaning that they have simple sugars, um, they, they do not have to go through the full process of digestion like your, like your vegetables would be, like your, your grains or your beans and so forth, simply because 
um, a portion of the digestive process have been handled due to the fact of the way that these items have been, um, you can say, created by our Savior. Okay, so imagine dealing with fruits that are predigestible, um, or you can say predigested, and then you take fats, like let's say you use like some olive oil. You, and olive oil now has to go through the full digestive process, okay? Remember this, olive oil has to go through the full digestive process. Coconut oil, all these fat-related items, they have to go through the full digestive process, as a matter of fact, an extensive digestive process that they, ha they have to go through. Now, if you take these oils and pour them over your simple carbs that are already pre-digested, what happens? Very simple. You have your simple carbs ready to digest, like let's say tomatoes, okay? You have your tomatoes ready to digest, but guess what? The tomatoes cannot be digested because the oil is covering it. The oil is making it difficult for it to digest because the oil takes longer to digest. Oils are harder to digest. So imagine the oil needs more time to digest. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me get a little water. Imagine the oil needs more time to digest while the tomatoes does not need as much time but because of the fact that you pour that olive oil as a salad dressing over the tomatoes, it actually now delays the digestive process of that tomato and so fermentation begins to take place. So basically what happened, the tomato is saying, so, hey, I'm ready to digest, I'm ready to digest. The oil says, hey, hold, hold tight, I got you covered. I got you covered. You cannot digest until I'm finished digested because I have you covered. So by time now that oil goes in for digestion, that tomato begins to putrefy. It begins to um, ferment. It begins to sour because it is taken longer in the digestive system than it was intended to take because of the fact it was, it was pre-digested. I don't know if that makes any sense to you. Um, but that's the problem we have when oil, being the form of dressing or anything, is placed over food. Um, your fats are the hardest thing to digest, so as a result, they tend to digest last. The simple carbs um, tend to digest much faster, so th that's why they should go first. Even when you're eating your food, you should consider eating um, to a certain degree in order, meaning you eat like your live foods first, um, then you go to your, your partial cook, and then you go to your other mixtures after. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Let's say you have lettuce. Um, that's a part of your salad bowl. You eat the lettuce first, for several reasons. Number one, because it's high in water content, it will, uh, it will require, um, it, will requ it will not require you considering drinking with the meal. That's number one. You know, we do not advocate people drinking with their meal. But because it's high in water content, if you take your time and thoroughly chew it, you will not require any liquids with the meal. Um, even though we do not recommend liquids with meal, that's number, number one. Number two, the liquids that you get, get from the, uh, that can even help, um, even though you may not think it's a lot, it can definitely help you to move on to other foods and aid with the breaking down of the others. It will help you with that, that mastication, that chewing process to kind of get things rolling, to let you know that you can chew the food. You don't have to eat and drink at the same time. Let's go on to our next slide. Um, avoid white and refined items from the diet. Remember this now. All meals should be eaten on a regular schedule with proper spacing and with proper combinations. So let's repeat that again. 
all meals should be eaten on a scheduled time with a minimum of five hours spacing, okay, with a minimum of five hours spacing, and also to simple combinations, meaning no more than three kinds or three families at one meal. Eat your fresh fruit, preferable, preferably to drinking fruit juice. You'll find that if you're dealing with digestive issue, I do not recommend you utilize liquid item other than water. Um, and that water, you'd want to drink at least 15 to 30 minutes before the meal. Preferably, if the digestive situ situation is real bad, about a 20 to 30 minutes would be better. So in that way, we'll give the stomach adequate time to build that gastric juice to aid with digestion. Okay, um, At least 8, 64 ounces of water should be drunk each day. And I don't want you to get caught up with numbers, okay? I'll tell you the, the principle that I use, especially being here in the Caribbean. You know, if you're here in the Caribbean where you're out in the sun, you're going to require more. So I normally tell individuals, just drink until the urine is clear to pale. Um, look at the color of your urine. As long as that color isn't clear, you need to keep on drinking. So just think of the urine as taking a look as when you're taking a shower. As you're taking a shower, if you're scrubbing and you're looking down and you see dirt is still coming off the body, you're going to keep on scrubbing. Well, it's the same principle. If you're urinating and you see that urine is still colored and it's colored not because you're taking um, a multivitamin, but because you're not being hydrated properly, you got to keep on drinking. And I recommend that you take two to three mouthfuls every 10 minutes, two to three mouthfuls every 10 minutes. And the reason being is the body can only handle roughly about two ounces of water at a time. So you don't want to flood the cells. You want to take in what the body needs and then move on. Remember now, um, do not use more, and I did mention t this to you before, did, do not men use more than two or three botanical families of fruits um, or vegetables at the same meal. Now, l let me clarify that. Um, it, in actuality, it should be uh, not just fruits, it should be of kinds at the same meal. So it's not just fruits and vegetables. Um, I would normally say do not use no more. L let me edit it right in front of us right here. Do not use no more than two botanical families of fruits or vegetables at the same meal. I, I prefer doing it that this way so there will not be any confusion because the most that you can have at one meal in terms of variety is three kinds or three botanical family and if you do all of them in fruits and veg um, fruits or vegetable then you would not have any room to bring in like the grains the beans and the seeds and things along that line so by editing it the way I just edited it it actually will work for either fruit or vegetables and still leave room for the, the other kind to come in. So let's read that now. Um, fruits and vegetables. Do not use more than two botanical families of fruits or vegetables at the same meal. Simplicity is the key to food mixtures. That would be a correct statement. Um, a perfect example of botanical families. Let, 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 let's, let's play around here with botanical families. Um, you, you know, let's say and I'm checking to see who, Kadisha, uh, let me mess with you, Kadisha. Um, Kadisha, let's say hypothetically I ask you to name the cabbage family. Let's say I ask you to name the cabbage family. Name some cabbages for me. Can someone name some cabbages for me? Kadisha, can you name some cabbages? L let me help you j just in the event you are wondering. Are you ready? Let me name some cabbages. You guys are going to be amazed when I do this, okay? You have, listen good. You have your Chinese cabbage, you have your purple cabbage, you have your traditional green cabbage. Uh, look, look at, watch this now. You have, watch this, broccoli, cauliflower, 
kale, collard greens. Uh, uh, wait a second. Are you following me so far? Do you see the direction I'm going? Um, you have things like radish. You have even things like watercress. You have things like Brussels sprouts. All these are considered cabbages, even though that they are different types. They all belong to the cruciferous family. Okay, So from a digestive standpoint, what the body does is that when the body sees all that variety, because it's within the same family, the body says one. The body still calls it one. And the reason being, the same enzymes that are required to digest cabbage is the same enzyme that's required to digest kale. So from a digestive standpoint, the body actually says it is one kind. Let, let, me, let, let me use another example. Let's say I ask, uh, Kadisha, back to you again. Let's say I ask you to name some cattle. Can you name some cattle for me? You, you know, if you go to the Bible, you'll actually see how the Bible actually does it. The Bible does it in, a, in an amazing way. If I was supposed to ask you to name some cattle, are you ready? Watch this. Here in the Caribbean, here in like Antigua, right? When I ask individuals to name some cattle, let's say cow, you know, you have the, the black and white cow, you have the, the, the cow with the, 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 the brown skin, the, some people say may, you have the whole steam, you have the long horn, you, you know. I, I said, no, I don't think you get what I'm saying. You're naming um, the types of cows. That's not what I ask you. I say, name some cattle, okay? Let me name some cattle for you so you understand. Goat, sheep, cow, deer, buffalo. Are you with me? Basically, what I'm naming is items that have four stomachs, okay? Um, so from a digestive standpoint... When the body actually sees these items, the body actually calls them, you know, one. The body actually calls them all cattle. From a digestive standpoint, the same enzyme to break down one is the same enzyme to break down all. So whenever you hear me say um, kinds, I'm not just referring to that specific item, but I'm referring to everything else that is within that family. Okay, so just to kind of give you some heads up on that. Let me give you one more last example as we move on. Let's say I ask you to name some melons or squashes. You know, melons or squashes, okay? Let, let's name some melons or squashes. You have watermelon. You have honeydew. You have cantaloupe. You have marshmallow. You watch this now. I'm continuing. You have pumpkin, you have zucchini, you have cucumber, you have butternut, you have summer squash, you have winter squash, you have crappy cucumber, you have the long neck squash. Uh, come on, saints, are you with me so far? If you watch those items from a plant standpoint, the plants almost look identical. All of those plants almost look identical. They all run the same way. They all have the same basic principle from a plant standpoint, from a characteristic standpoint. As a result, they are all called melons or they are all called squashes. They are one and the same. The same enzyme to break down one is the same enzyme to break down all. So when you're putting a plate together, if you put watermelon, honeydew, cantaloupe, marshmallow, pumpkin, zucchini, butternut, table squash, winter squash. If you put all of those on the same plate, even though it's a variety, the body still say one. So from a digestive standpoint, the body recognizes it as one. Same thing with the cabbage. Even though there's a variety of cabbages that we talked about, from a digestive standpoint, 
the body would have said one kind. Okay? And it's important you understand this because then what individuals tend to do is that when they, uh, when they have changed their diet and have gone total plant-based, they decide, hey, listen, I'm just going to eat a wide variety of fruits, a wide variety of this, a wide variety of that, not realizing you can do a wide variety, but you need to understand the physiology, you need to understand the botanical family of your plant items to get the most from a digestive standpoint out of these items. Okay, so I hope that made some sense there. Okay, and you see we continue on giving you some examples of botanical family like citrus, your orange, your grapefruit, your lemon, your lime, your tangerine, your, you know, all of these, even though they are a variety, they are considered one. From like in your banana family, you have your banana, your plant, and your finger rose, your bulk mint. Some country they call it froggy banana, they call it short banana, half banana, you know. From a digestive standpoint, those are considered one. Okay, so you get the basic principle here in terms of turning off the faucet. Turning off the faucet includes some basic principles. Let's do a quick revision on the basic principles. Eating on schedule, on schedule, on time, at all times. So eating on schedule, making sure that you have a specific time, making sure that the time is at least five hours space in, um, making sure that you eat your big meals for breakfast and lunch, and you're going to do light for supper. Also, making sure you're simple with your combinations, okay? No more than two or three botanical families at any given meal, okay? Those are some of the basic principles. Another basic principle that would have fit in um, right there is not eating and drinking at the same time. When an individual will drink 15 to 30 minutes before the meal or two hours after the meal. Now, did you hear how we set up the faucet there? Let me share with you something about what we just did. There are many people out there today that are dealing with leaky gut. They are dealing with acid reflux. And they take all of the doctor's medication. They take all of the prescription. And I'm here to tell you, they will never get well unless they institute those principles that we just share. This message that we have is a message of the highest order. It is a unique, it's a distinctive message, and it's a message that solves the problem unlike any other messages that you will hear out there. What you will find as you listen to other health presenters, they do not understand these basic principles that we have as Seventh-day Adventists that govern the basic machinery. They do not understand how long it takes for the stomach to em empty. They do not understand the importance of regularity. They do not understand the importance of the king, queen for breakfast, the prince, princess for lunch, and the pop of a supper principle. They don't fully understand it. And they do not understand the kind principle unlike um, how we understand it. We understand it in a detailed way. And that's why the Lord said, These are they which testify of me. Because even in the Bible, when you hear the Lord says, Animal after its kind, seeds after its kind, we heard the statement, but we never fully understood what it literally meant and i'm here to tell you what it literally meant is exactly what we're discussing this evening so let's continue now we are on the other principle now which unplugging the sink we just turned off the faucet now we do the unplugging of the sink now watch this now do not talk while eating or chewing with your mouth closed or uh, or chew with your, you say, do not talk while you're eating, um, and they say, chew with your mouth closed, okay? This causes too much air to enter the stomach, which causes indigestion and bloating. Um, what most people do not understand a lot of the times, the bloatedness that people find that are taking place in their stomach is actually air. It's literally air. Um, air from several different things. 
air from intestinal fermentation, from food literally fermenting. As a matter of fact, they found that when individuals eat and drink at the same time, it produces as much as 32 ounces of alcohol from indigestion. Okay? So basically, whenever you see someone with a distended stomach, this is a big belly, you can, you can say, um, a Christian beer belly, knowing that they are not, listen to me, they are not drinking alcohol, but yet still, they have the characteristics of an alcoholic. Where did they get it from? From eating and drinking at the same time, mixing the wrong combination of foods together. So as it ferments, it causes the distension. It causes the big belly. It causes the distension of the stomach. Okay? Um, I want to tell you, that's why a few years ago in the U.S., I don't know if you'd, you guys would recall this, but see if you'd recall, when they used to do the breathalyzer at first, they used to just arrest people if they show that they have a level of alcohol um, content. Um, the alcohol content was at a certain level. They would just arrest them one time. But there was a big case that literally came up where one gentleman, he was a devoted Christian, um, and many of his friends literally came and testified on his account that he was a Christian, he had never drank, so when they said they tested him and they saw that he had alcohol, he was able to completely refute it simply because he was not a drinker. Everyone around him that knew him would have, would have been able to come and testify on his behalf that he does not drink. And as a result, when they went and did additional testing on him, they realized that the alcohol that they detected um, in him was not alcohol um, that was manufactured by the brewery industry, but alcohol that came from fermentation of food. Okay? And that's why you see today now, they have since then changed how they do um, the breathalyzer type situation, um, where they will um, actually take the person in. They would not arrest, but they'll take the person in and check to make sure it is not food fermentation, um, but the person was literally drinking. I think when I read the article, what the article eventually said about the gentleman is that he had just finished drink. He had drank a milkshake, and, and because he had drank that milkshake, when they tested him, um, the, the, the consumption of that milkshake had the effect of literally consuming alcohol. And you remember um, a while back, we discussed that the combination of milk, eggs, and sugar causes fermentation. You, you know, milk, eggs, and sugar causes fermentation. So it actually showed that that was a correct statement. Let's go here. Vitamin D, you know, making sure that um, on an average, depending on where you are around the world, anywhere between 9 and 10 um, to 2 and 3, you want to make sure you get at least 45 minutes to an hour and a half of direct sunlight. It makes a difference. And some of you are in an extreme cold environment where you're extreme north. Those individuals may want to also consider um, doing some level of vitamin D supplementation to make sure that they maintain good health. Uh, digestive walks. Exercise aids in giving the digestive organs a healthy tone. A short walk after a meal with a head erect and the shoulders back exercising moderately is a great benefit. So here's what we suggest. And this is excellent not only for diabetics but for everybody. After you finish eat, head erect, shoulders back, and you go for a walk anywhere from 30, 15 to 30 minutes. This is not a brisk walk. This is a leisure casual walk. What it does, it puts a cap on how high that blood sugar level can go. Once that blood sugar hits that cap, it turns around and comes right back down. It also helps to massage the food down the stomach, facilitating digestion. It actually aids with digestion. Um, so uh, this is something that everyone should do. 
Now, someone would say, well, Brother Luke, um, I'm in a country where it snows excessively around this time of the year. And I don't know if I'm able to get outside and walk that 15 to 30 minutes because it's brittle cold. Not a problem. Just stand up and march in place. Mark time. Left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. But not brisk, just casual, okay? Um, that's the moderate exercise. Puts a cap over the, how high that sugar level can go and help massage the food down the stomach, facilitate digestion. Excellent to aid digestion. This actually prevents acid reflux. Um, walk for at least 45 minutes to an hour and a half daily. And, and remember this, that walking is the best exercise for diseased bodies. I can tell you this much. When individuals um, are actually showing that they have a level of um, uh, plaque built up in their body, they were able to look at the, 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 the blood vessels in the leg and show that when individuals do not walk, they were able to show how the plaque would build in the lower extremities of the body. But as soon as they jump on a walking program, within, listen to this, within three months after that person starts walking, you'll be amazed to see that those legs return back to someone who is actually highly active, we can actually see where you're having issues with poor circulation. All of that um, is completely gone. Um, and if someone continues for up to 30 to 36 months, we can get those legs back to that of a child. Now, we're going to go to the herbal agents now. This is the fun part of digestive aches and pains, okay? With the digestive aches and pains, we're going to deal, uh, I'll deal with some different scenarios, and I will tell you um, how to deal with some complex situation. Uh, I, I can tell you that you're going to get issues where people have H. pylori, what to do. Um, you know, you're going to have issues where people come with gastritis, where after they finish eat, you'll find that they vomit, they throw up, you know, they're having all kind of issues. What does one do in these situations? So we're going to take our time and we're going to walk through. But I want to read this scripture, um, scriptural quote. In Ezekiel 47 verse 12, it says, The fruit of the tree is for man's food and the leaves for his medicine. Okay, let's go. Herbal remedies. Um, you know, here in the Caribbean, where we have like aloes, um, in Antigua, we call it um, single Bible, you know, or we, or aloes, you know, either which way. Um, if someone is having issues with um, digestive issues, um, we are not talking ulcers, okay? But if we talk ulcers, we'll come back to um, aloes and ulcers. We'll get back to that. But I'm not talking ulcers yet, I'm not talking gastritis as yet, and I'm not talking H. pylori as yet. I'm talking basically simple digestive issues, okay? Um, what that individual can do, okay? Very simple. Food selection. Listen to this. Anytime someone comes to you with digestive, is uh, um, digestive issue, from a food selection, always remember this. You don't have to know the, all of the medicinal property of something. All you need to know is some basic properties about the item. Let me give you an idea. If you're dealing with any herbal agent, if you're dealing with any herbal agent, and the agent, listen good, is slippery and slimy, okay? If it is slippery and slimy, be it a fruit, be it a vegetable, be it food, if it's slippery and slimy, know that it's good for digestive health. Slippery and slimy, it's always good for digestive health. Okay? On top of that also too, if it tends to be, if, it, if it's like a, um, like a dry absorbent item, 
know that it's also good for di digestive health. You, you know, like charcoal. Um, and what most people don't realize is that Irish potato is excellent for digestive health. How is Irish potato good for digestive health? Very simple. You know like when you're cooking, if for some reason you accidentally oversalt a pot, you can just slice some Irish potato and put it in the pot and it actually literally extract the excessive salt from the pot. Well, just like how it extracts the excessive salt from the pot, it can actually aid with absorbing excessive acid in the body from digestive issue. It, it works amazing. So I just want to put, I'm, I'm, I'm helping you to think outside of the box, to get additional thought process concerning your thinking. Okay, so remember this, anything slippery and slimy. So let's go to some food. Things like okra, slippery and slimy. Prickled pear, um, I think in some of the Caribbean island they call it ratchet. Yeah, you know, um, here in Antigua we call it kasi. Okay, so you have, in Antigua we say kasi. In the U.S. they call it prickly pear. Um, but prickly pear is the fruit. I'm talking the leaf of the prickly pear tree. The leaf of the prickly pear tree. Um, in Trinidad, um, either Trinidad, I think they call it ratchet. Um, I don't, I can't recall the name that Jamaicans call it, okay? But it's that broad leaf, um, broad leaf from the prickly pear tree. Um, you'll, you'll find that it is slippery and slimy um, if you cut it, uh, which means it is good for digestive health. Now, for the, the, the prickly pear leaf, ratchet, Cassie, same item, how can one eat it? Um, one can definitely consume it different ways. They can just slice it and eat it raw, and it is excellent for digestive health. They can steam it and eat it slightly steamed, excellent for digestive health. They can blend it and make a drink. Um, and when, when I say blend, the most I want you to drink when you're drinking any liquid for digestive health is about two ounces is what I would like for you to drink. I don't want you drinking more than two ounces. Just two ounces is fine. It's excellent for digestive health. Now, aloes is excellent also for digestive health, but there's a special way to use aloe. There's a special way to use aloe. And here's how you use aloe, okay? Um, you cut the aloe plant and then you slice, slice it straight down the middle um, from once you cut it, slice it like how you slice bread. Um, you, you know, like how, I, I don't know if you, you, you like you have like titi bread, um, bread that, you know, you'd roll out with your hand, just kind of roll it and you slice straight across, not from the top down but straight across the center. Like when you're slicing bread to make sandwiches to, put, um, to fill, okay? If you're looking to fill a bread, you just slice it from, you know, kind of the bottom across. Uh, I don't know if you guys are understanding, but hopefully you'll understand. Um, it would be like a burger bun, like you're cutting a burger bun. That would be a perfect example. If you're cutting a burger bun, you know how you cut a burger bun. That's how you'd cut the aloe. When you cut the aloe that way, you scrape out the jelly, okay? Listen good. It's important you understand this. Because if you don't do it the way I'm suggesting, and you cut from top down, instead of having the healing process of the aloe, you'll, also, you'll actually get the, the, the laxative version of the aloe. Okay? If you cut from the top down, you're going to get the laxative version of the aloe. If you cut like how you cut the burger bun and scrape out the jelly, okay, uh, like you hear, aloe gel, you're scraping out the gel on the inside. If you get that, now that is the aspect that is good for digestive health. And here's how you can do it. You can get creative. You see, you can take one ounce of the aloe gel with one ounce of 
um, your, the best possible water in your country. And the best possible water will be water that is close to rainwater. Okay? Water that is close to rainwater. That would be how you do that. So one ounce of the gel with one ounce of the water. If someone has an extreme case of digestive issue, we'll go two ounces of the gel, one ounce of the water blended, and you drink that anywhere between 20 to 30 minutes before the meal. What that does, it goes, it coats the stomach and then allows you to go and eat where the stomach is already quoted. It's like someone who, um, uh, 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 someone who's getting ready to eat and then you find that the body will protect itself um, from the gastric juices. So it, um, it produces the, the mucus to help the, the, the body that in that way the, the, the acid from the digestive process does not destroy the lining of the stomach. Okay, so aloe kind of work um, like that. A um, couple of the herbs that I would have used right then and there, I would have also used one of two herbs. I would have used something called marshmallow or slippery M. Okay, any one of those two works amazing. Marshmallow or slippery M. Any one of those two, they work amazing. And you make a tea. You can make, if let's say you make enough of that tea, you can put it in the fridge and when you're ready, you take it out and eat it. It's going to be more like a gel or jelly as you consume it. Um, and as you see again too, you're going to take about two ounces of that gel about 20 to 30 minutes before your meal. Be it the slippery M, be it the marshmallow, be it the aloe, um, you're going to do that. Um, as long as you're not on medication, another item that can be used right here would be um, um, the charcoal, activated charcoal. Um, if you're on medication, you can rest assured that the, the charcoal will pull um, that medication out of the system. But as long as you're not on, char um, um, as long as you're not on medication, Charcoal is something that you can use here too. How much charcoal can an individual use? They can use a tablespoon of charcoal and just mix that with two ounces of water. It just makes it real nice. And go ahead and drink that. And um, you drink that again about a, a 20 to 30 minutes before the meal. And that would also help to deal with the stomach. Okay. Uh, one of the things that I recommend okay one of the things that I recommend is that individuals consider eating olives with their meal okay eating olives with their meal like almost every meal you eat um, consider eating some olives why eating the olives you'll find that the oil that is found in the olive is healing to an inflamed or irritated stomach so uh, whenever we make salads here in Antigua, um, you'll find that many times we put um, olives in our salads uh, and um, we put olives in the pasta, olives in the rice. We'll put olives in something just to kind of help the people out a little because we know a lot of individuals here are dealing with digestive issue and we figured by putting the olives in, it would actually give them um, a little jump. Now, let me share this with you. Normally, right, I would never use oil. But there are times, listen good, normally I would not use oil, but there's, there are times, like in a case with um, acid reflux, right, where if someone has an extreme case of acid reflux, and you're trying and trying and trying and you find that nothing is working, if you take one to two teaspoons of olive oil at the end of the meal, or you can even do it before the meal, you, you, you know, um, do you know that, in actuality, it's best you do it at the end of the meal. Just do it at the end. Do you know that that will go in and coat the stomach, and if there's a burning, a serious burning, it will just like calm it down. It's like actually um, out in a fire. 
Okay? So, um, just remember now that olive oil, okay, not coconut oil, olive oil specifically, um, can be used as a medicine in terms of actually dealing with um, an irritated, inflamed stomach, okay? Uh, I've used that numerous times and I've gotten tremendous results. It's also laxative. So if individuals say, hey, I find out when I take that oil, I have a bowel movement, of course, because it, it's also laxative. So keep that in mind, okay? But if you follow the principles that we're putting out, you should never have to do this more than a three day. You know, if you have to do it, the most you'll have to do it for will be three days, okay? Um, I'm not an advocate for you to continue using free oil like that. And the reason being is because we know that when oil is taken, oil actually damages the endothelium. It damages the inner lining of the blood vessel. Um, however, when you're having digestive issue, in this case, um, it's being used as a medicine and it would be necessary if you need to. Now, let me share this with you. I've given you several different treatments so far. Any one of them will work, okay? You don't have to use them all. Any one of them will work. Now, sometimes some, situa some people's situation is so grievous that you may need multiple options. If you need multiple options, I've given you multiple options there. Um, but under normal circumstances, any one of those situations will work. And it takes us three days having someone following the program to get full relief from this situation. Three days. Uh, I remember I was in Florida and this nurse was scheduled for stomach surgery. And by the time I put her on the program, I actually had to go on a two-meal program, show her the proper spacing, making sure she eats on schedule, on time, at all time, big breakfast, big, big lunch, nothing for supper. Do you know by the end of the week she no longer required surgery? Simply because of the fact we put her on the program and I put her on something called intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting is where she did not eat anything from about 2 in the afternoon to 6 a.m. in the morning, okay? So giving the stomach at least, okay, let, let's go 2 to 2, that's 12, okay? Um, and then to, to 6 in the morning, uh, so that's um, 14, uh, 16 hours, excuse me, 16 hours we allow that stomach to rest before any food was put back into it. Um, that is called intermittent fasting. Um, if you want someone's stomach to heal and heal extremely fast, consider doing intermittent fasting. Okay, so that will help with most of your digestive issue. Most, most digestive, <clears throat> excuse me, most, di most digestive issue that you put before me those simple treatments that I just mentioned can solve it. You can even use ginger tea as a means of helping too. Ginger works amazingly. Chamomile works amazing. Um, but especially ginger works amazing. Okay. Now, um, gastritis. Okay, wait, wait. Before I go to the gastritis, before I go to gastritis, let me see here where I want to go. Okay, I want to go... Let's see here. Oh. Okay, no. I'm going to go here. Um, th there's one, H. pylori. Now, i got to tell you a, f a story about H. pylori. I'm gonna deal I, I didn't put the H. pylori in, so I'm going to address it, and then I'll move down. Tell you a story with H. pylori. I have a friend of mine um, here in Antigua, and he works at the lab. Um, he basically runs the lab here in Antigua. And one of the things he does, the, the guy, he tests everything, okay? He tests everything. And I want to tell you a story that he shared with me about two weeks ago. He came into the health food store, and he and I were there talking. We're talking about, we talk about everything, basically, when it comes to health. And he said to me, you know, James, I've got to tell you a story about that oregano oil that you're always talking about. And he said... 
um, a, a family came to him and some physicians had recommended that the, the family come and they write up a script to do, you know, to do some blood work to kind of check to see if they were being tested positive for the E. coli bacteria um, because they'd give them some medication. And lo and behold, after the two weeks when the medication um, was finished, they, he, they, the person went, the person came first, tested, showed positive for the E. coli bacteria. Two weeks later, after following the prescription of the medical doctor, lo and behold, the E. coli bacteria was still there. Um, I think the person went back, got some more script, um, prescription. They did it again. Two weeks later, the E. coli bacteria is still there. No matter what they were trying, could not get rid of the E. coli bacteria. Lo and behold, um, they decided to use the oregano oil. And they began using several drops um, daily. At the end of two weeks, when he went back and he tested, lo and behold, the E. coli bacteria was completely dead. Okay, there was no more gone, there was no more sign of the E. coli bacteria. The gentleman says it blew his mind. He was so amazed. Another, um, so one day, you know, he was, just, he was just having, you know, regular kicks at the office. And he says, you know, James, I always test myself periodically to just make sure that I'm in optimum health and so forth. And he says, I decided to test myself to see if I have H. pylori. And he says, lo and behold, when he tested himself, there goes the H. pylori. So he called his wife. He said, honey, come to the lab. I want to check something. His wife came to the lab, he tested his wife, and lo and behold, she too have H. pylori. He told um, one of his friends, who is a medical doctor, the medical doctor wrote him a, a, a script, strong prescription. He followed the script to a T, two weeks later, go back, check, H. pylori is still there shared the information with another medical doctor, because he deals with basically all the medical doctors here in Antigua. The other medical doctor says, hey, listen, I'm going to give you something so hard that it's going to just knock that thing for six. Lick it out one time. He took what the other medical doctor said. Two weeks later, went back and checked. Still have H. pylori. Decided now, let him try the oregano oil. Took a few drops on a regular basis. Two weeks later, he went, H. pylori, gone, completely destroyed. You'll find that when you're dealing with oregano oil, or some people say oregano oil, one of the things about this oil, it's antifungal, it's antiviral, it's antibacterial, it's antiseptic, it's antibiotic. It's amazing, okay? This oil is amazing. Every single family needs to have some um, oregano or oregano oil in their home in the event of any form of medical emergency. It works amazingly. Okay, so I thought I'd put that in there for H. pylori. Um, another thing that I found that actually works real good for H. pylori is actually literal garlic, literal garlic. Um, and one of the things that you got to be careful with now is actually how you use garlic. Because if you use garlic the wrong way, it can actually harm you. So just remember that garlic is excellent for H. pylori. My favorite item for H. pylori is the oregano oil. Gastritis and heartburn. Now, gastritis is rather it's rather tricky when you deal with gastritis and ulcers i should have put ulcers here let me see if i put it somewhere else okay no i did not okay i should have put ulcers uh, right here it says gastritis heartburn i should have put ulcers there too okay 
Um, for years, when this, this, specifically one, this specific one came to me, the gastritis and the ulcer came to me, um, I used to have a little problem when I deal with it. Um, and I never got it right initially. Today, with ease, by God's grace, I get it right. But when it first came to me, I did not have the formula down properly. Today I do. Um, and the best formula to use for gastritis and ulcers, okay, um, and even the heartburn, okay, and this is the heartburn that would cause you to vomit. If it's not heartburn that causes you to vomit, that can go with the first treatment that I just mentioned, okay. Um, gastritis and ulcers, you'll find that these will cause you to vomit. If you find that you're vomiting up food or, or just getting extremely bad feeling after eating, um, this would be the treatment that you'd use. So what I do, I would get like a quarter of a cabbage. Um, I normally use the green cabbage if you want. Or uh, some people say the yellow cabbage. Well, I, I, I would refer to it. So some people refer to it as the white cabbage, I should say. Um, I, I use a quarter of the cabbage. Um, so I'd use a quarter of the cabbage to about 20 ounces of water. And I would use water that has the pH closest to the hum to, to rain water. Okay, so I'd use the, the quarter cabbage with 20 ounces of water. And I will blend that in a high-speed blender until it comes to liquid. Okay, total liquid. And I will have my clients drink that um, about 20 minutes. Oh, and tell you how much to drink. They just take two ounces. Two ounces, 20 minutes before each meal and I will tell you that within one week um, the gastritis the extreme heartburn or the ulcer would have been resolved within one week okay um, so let me repeat that treatment again so for gastritis for um, ulcers for extreme heartburn what I use in that situation, I use um, a quarter cabbage with 20 ounces of water that is close to rain water. If you have rain water, use rain water. But if you don't have rain water, get one with a pH that is going to be between 5.5 but yet still less than 7, less than neutral. Um, I use acid water to, to make it, okay? Um, and... I mix that, and you, you got to remember now, when you deal with the stomach, the stomach is highly acidic. The last thing you want to do is to make the stomach alkaline. You make the stomach alkaline, you're going to have problems with breaking down proteins and things along that line. So I use the, um, I use the, the 20 ounces of water, combine the 20 ounces of water with... The, the quarter cabbage, blend that together, and then I'll use two ounces before each meal, 20 minutes before each meal, before breakfast, before lunch, um, and you'll find that with individuals who are suffering with ulcers and gastritis, you very likely may have to give them three meals, because if you don't give them that third meal, as soon as they get hungry, they start vomiting, okay? So it's, it's a real serious issue. So what I do, I'll give them the third meal, and again, I'll give them that two ounces 20 minutes before the supper. And roughly within three days, I'll get real, I'll get real good results from day one. Within three days, phenomenal results. Within one week, I'll have that situation completely arrested. But if for some reason that the situation is a little bit more serious and it requires a little, going for a little longer, don't be afraid to go a little longer. Now, I've got to tell you this, okay? Um, it's important that if you're going to use the raw cabbage juice, it's important to add some level of kelp 
to the diet. You got to cook with the kelp in your diet. And the reason, if you don't cook with the kelp in the diet, you need to take the kelp capsules. Um, and you'll need to take at least one capsule per meal. And the reason being, you'll find that if you take in raw cabbage juice um, for that often, for one week, it will affect your thyroid unless you combine it with the kelp. You don't put the kelp in the cabbage juice, but you'll have the kelp with the meal. If you have the kelp for all three meals, it, it could be a capsule or or you can sprinkle a little powder over whatever you're eating, or you can use it in your food preparation, um, it will be able to use to counter the, the potential negative, negative effect of the raw cabbage juice. So that is a must. If you don't do that, you will have some problems with the thyroid acting up later on, okay? So remember that's a must. Um, Slippery M and marshmallow, you can also, in addition to what I just mentioned, you can use um, like four capsules um, of the Slippery M or the marshmallow before each meal. And I normally use the capsules that I make, which is about 650 milligrams, but if you don't have those, any um, um, capsule, be it Slippery M or marshmallow that you found out there, could be Nature's Way or any reputable brand that you find out there, you can actually use, okay? So don't be afraid to use that. Um, uh, so Slippery M, Marshmallow, four tablets before the meal, um, but 20 minutes before the meal, or it could be as much as 30 minutes before the meal, you would actually use... Um, the, the raw cabbage juice that I mentioned. Now, if for some reason the cabbage juice is too strong for you, all you got to do is use the cabbage juice for one meal. Use the cabbage juice for one meal. If you use it for at least the breakfast meal, um, we can try and see how the, the um, Slippery M or Marshmallow will work for the, the other meals. If they're not working, then we'll use the, the cabbage juice for the other meals, them also too. Okay. I, I, hope, I hope, you know, there's some level of clarity there for that. So what I just mentioned will solve gastritis, heartburn, as well as um, ulcers. Now, with all digestive issues, with all digestive issues. Remember this, you're going to always have to use a probiotic and digestive enzymes. With all digestive issues, you got to use a probiotic and digestive issue. Um, digest, um, probiotic and digestive enzymes. Why? Because of the issue you have, the stomach lining would have been damaged. And these items will help us with the, with the rebuilding of that stomach lining, okay? So um, a digestive enzyme, the brand that I like, I like a brand by the name of Trienza. That's the brand, that's my go-to brand. And for the probiotic, I would use something called either PB-8 for individuals who cannot tolerate any level of dairy, or I would use um, a, my favorite brand go-to, which is BioCult. Um, as a probiotic, okay? So that's what I would use um, in that situation. Now, you see it says indigestion, the weight mentioned, you can use some carrot juice, beet juice, kelp, papaya, and so forth. Um, those are stuff that, yes, you can use, but again, too, um, I don't use any of the juices, okay? I don't use any of the juices. You can use them, but I'm just telling you personally, I don't use any of the juices. All I use, again, for the same indigestion day again, um, I use the Slippery M or the Marshmallow. I have the person eat on schedule, on time, everything that I just mentioned to you. And then they come back also to with the, um, 
the, the bio cult or the di and, and the digestive enzyme to help stabilize things, okay? So for the acid reflux, the first treatment that I originally mentioned is what I would use, making sure that there's olives with each meal and so forth, not eating and drinking at the same time, eating on schedule, proper spacing of the meal, simple combination of kinds is what I use. Heartburn and acidosis, okay? Um, again, um, very simple. If the heartburn is extreme, if the heartburn is extreme, that's where I go now to my go-to, which is the cabbage juice that I mentioned. If it is not an extreme situation, I stick with my slippery M, my marshmallow, um, my digestive enzymes, my probiotic. Same, pr same basic principle, making sure that they're eating on schedule, on time, at all times, and I get tremendous results. Now, if you look right there, um, it shows that licorice is excellent for um, acidosis as well as heartburn, okay? However, one of the things about licorice you got to be careful with is that it will raise the blood pressure by about 20 points. So you got to be careful. If you're one that struggles with high blood pressure, you definitely do not want to use any licorice in the preparation. Now, you have... Um, gas, um, be it farting, bloating, you, you know, things along that line. Um, if you take a look right here, you, you, you see some simple herbs that you can use um, in the form of a tea. Uh, and this would help tremendously, but you still follow the principle that we outlay initially. The principle that we outlay is that you eat in on schedule, on time, at all times and we can use the slippery M or the marshmallow and combine it with the probiotic and the digestive enzyme. And I want to also add, okay, I'm going to put the belching up there with them, okay? Um, a lot of times you may find that one of the reasons why someone may have these things is because they have allergies. So what I would do, we have a special allergy program that we will introduce at this time um, where we take out any potential foods that can be a potential allergen, things like wheat and barley and rye and oats um, and, and, you know, in terms of fruits and vegetables, like vegetables will take out things like um, carrots and celery <clears throat> um, with fruits. We'll take out things like the entire banana family like banana, plantain, bogamint, finger moss, finger roast, froggy, shot banana, you know, we'll take those out. We'll take out things like ragweeds, like the entire melon family, watermelon, honeydew, cantaloupe, marshmallow, cucumber, zucchini, butternut, pumpkin, summer squash, winter squash, you know, all those ragweeds, pull those. And you'll be amazed to see the result that we get when we're dealing with these situations. Okay, so in addition to these T's that you see, for the flatulence, the gas, the bloating, the belching, we would use simple T's um, like um, the balm, um, spearmint, ginger, anise, caraway, fennel, dill, horse balm, sage, thyme, cardamom. And if you want that when you're cooking, please feel free to, um, to add these to your food that you're cooking. And what it does is that if you're cooking for public or if you're cooking for family members, you'll find that you can actually help to arrest any of these digestive issues that they may have by incorporating these items with it. Now, I want to add something else too. You see this lemon juice? You're not able to use lemon juice when people have, listen, you need to remember this. If someone have an ulcer, or if they have gastritis, or extreme acidity, extreme digestive issue, you cannot use no lemon juice. If you use lemon juice with individuals who have gastritis, or who have ulcers, or who have an extreme acidic condition, they will end up in the hospital and you will be blamed. 
So it is important that for these individuals that you do not use lemon juice, okay? Um, for just mild cases of things, the lemon juice is fine. But extreme cases, no lemon juice should be incorporated into what you're doing here. Um, you'll find that once the healing takes place, the lemon juice is essential and can be re-added to the program. But while you're trying to resolve the issue, um, you may find that in most cases, you may have to leave the lemon juice out in its entirety, otherwise it will become a medical situation for that individual. Um, if someone has insufficient stomach acid, insufficient stomach acid, we have something called um, betaine HCL, okay? Um, and we use the, the betaine HCL, and that actually increases hydrochloric acid production. Um, I, I'll tell you this, which is deep. If you study the, 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 the um, I, I, what's the family name? The Okinawans from Okinawa, Japan. You'll find that after the age of 40, one of the things that they do, they tend to eat one-third less. They tend to eat less. And that's amazing, you know, as you study that, because as you study the Bible, you realize that the Lord grants man three score and ten. A score is twenty, which mean, means that on an average, most men, God grants us at least seventy years. And he said, by reason of strength, you can go a little further. Okay? When you stop to think about that, right? Three score and ten, and by reason of strength, okay? Watch this. From the age of 35, we find that the stomach actually produces less stomach acid, okay? Which means that once you get halfway to that 70 mark, we realize that you basically should be eating less than what you used to eat prior to that 35 um, year of age. So naturally, what the body is saying to normal human beings is that as you mature, as you age, consider eating less because the hydrochloric acid production will lessen as you age. From the time you hit 35, it diminishes and it just keeps diminishes, um, going down, going down, going down, going down, which means that you should actually be eating less as you age, okay? So keep that in mind. So what I do whenever I'm dealing with anybody who have digestive issue, um, especially like, I should say, specifically low stomach acid, I would use the betaine HCL to help me increase hydrochloric acid production to help break down the food that we can have adequate absorption of our proteins, um, carbohydrates, B12, you know, and minerals and so forth. I uh, want to add something else too. Anytime individuals have acid reflux, know that it's very likely that they're going to have some form of nutritional de nutrition, nutrition deficiencies. What do I mean by that? If you find that you have acid reflux, it's very likely you have leaky gut, you have damage to the gut lining. So like your trace minerals, your um, B vitamins, you're probably going to have some challenges along that line. And with that being said, it, it, it's going to be best that you use some form of multivitamin that, um, that has the complete vitamin listing, but yet still it's also sensitive to individuals with allergies and so forth. And that's why at this moment I love the brand um, 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 buried treasure simply because of the fact that all of the items they are mindful, they are free from shellfish products they are also um, are very good when it comes to being wheat free, dairy free, yeast free and so forth. So from a digestive standpoint the buried treasure line is a nice multivitamin that I tend to use whenever I'm dealing with digestive issue. 
Well, we have come to the end of our presentation, and you know, and I hope that what I shared uh, would have been beneficial to you. And if there's any question, do not hesitate. But if you follow everything that I share, I know that you'll get your desired result. Normally, um, as I mentioned, within three days to about a week, um, most digestive issues are completely arrested. Um, I'll read this last, last quote that I skipped out here. For someone who has excessive stomach, stomach acid, um, indications or indicators are burning sensation in the stomach, heartburn, reflux disease. Let's say use a few nuts at the beginning of a meal to work on the stomach juices. Um, and as I mentioned to you too, uh, if you're using like the Slippery M, if you're using the marshmallow, if you don't, uh, if you're not on any medication and use a little activated charcoal, um, you'll find that these would actually solve the problem also too. But the key is, is making sure that you eat on schedule, on time, at all times. And once you do these things, you'll correct all forms of digestive issue. I just want to say thank you so much for the opportunity to serve you this evening. And we're going to end our lecture here tonight. And then we'll pick up with um, our Q&A. So let me end the lecture. And we'll pick up on Q&A. Okay, let's go ahead and end the lecture here.